Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. This one, the biggest item, is in rumor status, and it's AMD's semi-custom solutions for the next-gen consoles. Finally, getting some specifications leaked out. Uh, Roman also responded to our overclocking challenge. He's a couple of months late, but uh, he did need to wait for Asus to help him, so that's understandable. IDC and Gartner reporting that Intel CPU shortages are affecting sales, obviously, but the interesting part is that both of them align in their views, which is rare. And then a couple of other things, like Steam's hardware survey for March of 2019 has given us some more stats on market share, following up on our sales volume post for Intel and AMD. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Gigabyte Z390 AORUS Master Motherboard, which comes equipped with one of the more powerful Z390 VRMs for heavier overclocks on the new 9th gen Intel CPUs. The AORUS Master is also one of the few motherboards with a real heatsink this generation, featuring a mix of high surface area fins and looks-oriented cover blocks. Oh, and it's also got updated RGB illumination. Learn more at the link below. So the quick GN news item for this one, we have the mod mats finally coming back in. So we just got the shipping information and they're on the way, which means if you have orders in, they'll be shipping out soon. And if you don't have an order in, you should get one in so that you can get a mod mat shipped out to you as soon as they arrive, which will be in the next probably 10 or so days at this point. So uh, medium and large will be back in stock shortly on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick one up. Let's start with the AMD news item. So this one is expansion on speculation that AMD is working on the next SoC set to power next generation consoles from Microsoft and Sony. While not confirmed by AMD, rumors suggest that the chip will take the form of a semi-custom APU named Gonzalo. A Twitter user by the name of TUM underscore API SAK alleges that there is now a qualification sample in existence and it was spotted in the 3D Mark database with a code name of, it's really long, ZG16702AE8JB2 underscore 32 slash 10 slash 18 underscore 13 F8, which of course we all know is the APU for these consoles. And assuming that this leak is accurate, and it looks like it may be, it would indicate that AMD is late in the development process nearing completion and that volume production could be near. More interesting is how much of the qualification sample has changed from the rumored engineering sample spotted back in January. It's looking like an increased 1.6 gigahertz base clock, a revised stepping going from A2 to B2, and a different version of Navi 10 Lite running at 1.8 gigahertz, suggested by the new PCI ID 13E9. All of this would align with the conjecture that AMD has made considerable progress on the APU and is nearing the production stage. But of course, take with salt as prescribed, uh, though we are nearing the point where we should start seeing real specs officially confirmed. Next one is Roman Derbauer finally responding to our, uh, our overclocking challenge. So Roman overclocked to, I think it was 20, 80 TIs using some voltage mods and was able to take the new two card high score in the 3D Mark Hall of Fame. So he's got a video up. You should watch it if you haven't. And it should get things pretty interesting again because at some point we'll respond. It's just a matter of, uh, I guess, what equipment we're using at this point or if we're waiting for anything like certain new video cards. So he went to some event, I think an Asus event in Russia and set up a system there, did the benchmarks. He's got a video on it and it's pretty cool. You should check it out. But uh, we will be responding at some point in the future. So keep an eye out for live stream announcements from us as we continue to try and brute force their Bauer into a losing position by having more expensive parts than him because that's the only way it happens. IDC and Gartner both reporting that Intel has a CPU shortage issue. We've been talking about this for a long time now. We just published in the last week our Intel and AMD sales volume roundup for our viewers, but that extends past our viewership too in some ways. So the interesting bit here is that while the statistics and numbers tend to be different between Gartner and uh, IDC for their reports, the one thing that they both agree on is Intel's contribution to declining PC shipments in first quarter of 2019, which is something that Microsoft also uh, indirectly accused Intel of, basically saying, Windows 10 had lower adoption than expected because one of their major partners couldn't supply enough chips to the market, which is obviously Intel. So both firms agree that Intel's continued CPU shortages affected the global PC market, particularly the low-end market uh, where Intel has 
more or less abandoned some of the Pentium chips and products along those lines in favor of saving their fab space for higher end, higher ASP products. Many manufacturers, especially those not among the big three, so that'd be Dell, HP, Lenovo, uh, were forced to look elsewhere for CPUs, including AMD, in some cases for the first time in a long time. Gartner Senior Principal Analyst Ms. Kitagawa said the following, the supply constraints affected the vendor competitive landscape as leading vendors had better allocation of chips and also began sourcing alternative CPUs from AMD. The top three vendors worldwide were still able to increase shipments despite the supply constraint by focusing on their high-end products and taking share from small vendors that struggled to secure CPUs. Moreover, the constraints resulted in the top vendors shifting their product mix to the high-end segment in order to deal with these constraints, which, along with favorable component price trends, should boost profit margins. So the system integrators and OEMs then are shifting as the quote says, some of their focus toward the high end, which helps prop up the margins and make up for Intel's inability to meet demand at present. IDC reiterated that more PC makers are turning to AMD for solutions, so we've got uh, two large sources for that, rather than waiting on Intel, and that the vendors have been more focused on commercial and business consumers for their pre-built systems, rather than looking at the uh, average end user. And the quote from them is, furthermore, more PC brands turned to AMD chips. All of this combined with firms rounding the last corner on its Windows 10 migration deployments led to a shift in the market for traditional PCs toward more commercial and premium products. And IDC also said that, quote, Intel CPU shortages continued to pose a production bottleneck for PC makers. And then further cited that uh, all of this is uh, also in addition to consumer interest on a downtrend for new PCs. This is something we've heard for a long time now. So the enthusiast market is a bit of a bubble where there's still a, a high volume of purchasing relative to previous years, whereas pre-built desktops are uh, for end users, not for gamers, are, are on a continual downtrend. IDC and Gartner both differ in how they interpret the market data, and they have different numbers as well. Uh, and they have different opinions on the leading PC makers. So the fact that they align in these things, Intel CPU shortages affecting the market as a whole, is a, an important point to note. And we'll have a link to additional coverage on that. They're the IDC and the Gartner reports in our show notes linked in the description below. Steam has released its hardware survey for March of 2019. Market share hasn't changed much year over year, despite our recent sales volume results showing GN's viewers shifting buying habits significantly. The difference here is that because with a market that's much larger than our small enthusiast segment, it takes a long time for the ships to turn. Intel and Nvidia jointly hold almost all of the notebook market and the pre-built desktop market, at least for years past, meaning that AMD's inroads to the DIY enthusiast space will be obscured by this data and AMD still has a very long way to go despite recent positive news like the previous story. In Steam's survey, AMD holds about 18.1% market share to Intel's 81.9% market share for gaming CPUs, with 56% of users still on quad-core CPUs. Video card usage and market share is always awkwardly measured in Valve survey, as it includes Intel IGPs as part of the GPU measurement, although we wouldn't traditionally really count those. Either way, counting Intel, Steam shows Nvidia at 75%, AMD at about 15%, and Intel at about 10%, just meaning that there's an Intel IGP in that amount of systems. DirectX 12 is gaining popularity in a more noteworthy way, progressing from 50% to about 65% market share over the past year. If you remember Spectre and Meltdown, there's still more to that story, but now there's a new one called Spoiler. This has been spoiled for a little while at this point, but Intel finally responded to it. So Intel gave the spoiler exploit a low-risk advisory, and this is following the exploit being dropped into Intel's lap. Uh, it is somewhat unique. It only affects Intel CPUs. It does not affect ARM. It does not affect AMD at present, and this is because of a proprietary memory subsystem that Intel uses on its products, not used on the others, which includes a memory order buffer that spoiler is able to directly target. Previous side channel attacks include the out of order execution attacks and Spectre and Meltdown Spectre, which affects CPUs for the last couple of, well, more than a decade, uh, was one of the bigger ones, but spoiler is the recent one. So spoiler leverages speculative execution as well and the inherent weakness in Intel's memory subsystem to leak critical information about page mappings, physical address mappings, 
and it can also be used to bolster other known memory attacks like row hammer or other side channel attacks. Even though spoiler abuses speculative execution, it affects an entirely different area of the CPU. Thus, current Spectre and Meltdown mitigations aren't applicable and don't work for this one. What's more is researchers noted that Intel likely won't be able to deliver a microcode patch due to the complexity of the memory subsystem, at least not without a massive performance degradation. In response, Intel officially issued a security advisory on its site and has given Spoiler a CVE identifier. In the advisory, Intel assigns Spoiler a CVSS base score of 3.8 out of 10, which indicates a low security risk. Intel doesn't say much else about Spoiler other than it would require an authenticated user and local access to hardware, which is likely why it doesn't appear overly concerned with the flaw. Spoiler is another testament that CPUs need hardware mitigation for security threats at this point, involving the overhaul of, to some extent, the actual design of the architecture. Other research papers have noted previously that modern CPU design has deprioritized security in the name of performance, and we're starting to see the consequences of such designs. Quick one on NVIDIA here. We talked about RTX or DXR support coming to some of the 10 series cards previously when we noted that everything above a 1063 gigabyte would support DXR on the new drivers. Those drivers are finally out. So if you've wanted them and you wanted to try DXR on a Pascal 10 series card, you can now do so. Games have to support this as well, but if you wanted to try it out, uh, NVIDIA's got a couple of performance numbers. They're really more or less what you would expect. This instance of DXR on GTX sort of serves two to three purposes. And one of them is it's a try before you buy. So for owners of Pascal, they can now see what DXR RTX features might look like, even if they don't get a frame rate that's particularly desirable, the user can still see the end result. And that may, from a sales standpoint, convince them their hardware is out of date and they need to upgrade. Uh, so that's potentially one, one upside from NVIDIA's viewpoint, or if you're a user and you do want to see what RTX and DXR really look like without just looking at YouTube videos, then you could now try that. Uh, separately, this is also a way for NVIDIA to sort of prove the point that from, from NVIDIA's viewpoint, look, you need Taurine to actually do this stuff properly. And if you don't believe us, go ahead and try it. We'll give you the ability to on Pascal. So that's, that's point number two. Point number three is that Although it may be inadvisable, this does technically widen the pool of developers and make it a bit easier for RTX and DXR adoption to happen as most of the market that is uh, on modern hardware may still be on Pascal 10 series cards since 20 is not that old yet. So it does widen that user base, even if it's not a particularly a good piece of hardware for ray tracing, it's still doable, at least on some of them, like the 1080 Ti. So they've got some numbers on that if you're really curious about it, but not too much to look at. Up next, Intel Optane Memory H10 SSDs. Intel announced its new Optane Memory H10 drives will be coming to the laptop market later this year. The new Optane drives combine Optane Memory and QLC NAND in an M2 form factor. Flash and Optane are two distinct types of storage, and as such, the new drives will use two separate controllers for each. The new Optane H10 drives will present themselves to the operating system as two separate PCIe drives, which will require motherboard supporting PCIe bifurcation. From there, the drives are combined using Intel's rapid storage technology, which will then use the Optane memory as something of a cache system for frequently accessed data. Intel has some lofty claims for the H10 SSD, stating that they will launch games 60% faster to check faster than what, you'll need to check the slide appendix for each of these claims. They will apparently load documents two times faster for what that's worth and open multimedia files up to 90% faster, which could be useful for the large files. And the H10 drives aren't being sold to the consumer just yet, not exactly. Rather, they're coming from OEMs in new laptops slated for second quarter of 2019. However, as Tom's Hardware notes, support for the DIY market is coming in the near future. Unshockingly, Adobe, is ending Shockwave support. It's discontinued. So Adobe has officially taken Shockwave off of life support and has declared the plugin officially end of life to no one's surprise. Honestly, we thought it was already dead. But Shockwave was first deployed in 95 for rich media format files and interactive content for websites and CD-ROMs. Uh, however, with the migration of technology such as HTML5, WebGL, Shockwave was supplanted and has 
been largely unused except for perhaps the small local business website down the street from you that hasn't updated since the mid-90s. No one uses CD-ROMs anymore anyway. So Shockwave going away, uh, really not, not too big of a shock. And Adobe plans to kill off Flash in 2020. So that'll be the next big death from Adobe's product line. Adobe has taken down the page for Shockwave. So if you want to get it, the version number you need to look up is 12.3.5.205. That's the last iteration of the software. The last news item is the 9990XE and its price, which is $2,800. So if you found yourself with an extra three grand or so, and you couldn't think of how to spend it, the 9990XE, which was a, an auction-only processor, is now available via retail through Case King. And this isn't something we necessarily expected because it, it was such a limited auction that there were, uh, there were uh, system integrators who only got one, like Puget Systems and iBuyPower, they both bought one, one CPU. The companies that typically buy them on the order of hundreds uh, or potentially thousands, depending on the size of the company, they're buying one of them. So this thing is available via retail now. Kskin has it. It's the German uh, large site they work with. OC UK as well, but if you wanted to import it to the US or elsewhere, you could. Case Kane has system builds available aimed at streaming that use the 9990XE for the primary system and a 9600K for the secondary system. The system also uses a 2080 Ti, an Asus Omega motherboard, and an Elgato 4K60 Pro capture card. And the Kane Mod CKPC843, as it's called, will cost 12000 999.90 euros in addition to taxes and shipping. I guess if you wanted it, you could get it, but uh, very small market for that. Even the SIs were a small market for that one. So that's it for this video. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.cameransnexus.net if you want to get on back order for our medium or large mod mats, which are coming in in the next 10 days or so. And I'll see you all next time.